Good morning. Happy Wednesday. I hope that your Wednesday is off to a good start. Mine is so far. Second cup of coffee, outdoor office. Over the last several weeks, if you've been if you've been here on Wednesday mornings, I've been talking of talking about John Wesley, um, sort of what made made him tick. Um, and so we began several weeks ago just looking at the things that influenced him, um, particularly theologically, and then we since then are moving into some of the distinctives, some of the real hallmarks of Wesleyan thought, um, his use of the Bible, <clears throat> his his idea of original sin, and then last week, um, the new birth. And with, really with the, what we're into now, are the real core elements of Wesleyan thought. That's the idea of the new birth is totally central to Wesley. Um, that, along with his understanding of justification, totally central. They are the heart of um, of Christianity for him. So for today, we begin talking about grace. If you have anyone who has any sort of a passing knowledge of Wesleyan theology, Wesleyan thought, knows, remembers that um, Wesley conceived of grace in three different ways. Or maybe we could say there are three different ways that we can experience the grace of God. There's prevenient grace, which Wesley actually normally referred to in his writings as preventing grace. More commonly now is we call it prevenient grace. There's prevenient grace, there's justifying grace, and there's sanctifying grace. Um, and there's simply three different ways that we experience the grace of God. And when we get to this, un our understanding of God's grace, particularly the prevenient grace, at this point, Wesley is going to be coming into conflict with, with Calvinists. His biggest theological conflicts were with um, Calvinists, and for a while there during his career, he had a regular pamphlet war going on with them. Um, so what is prevenient grace? <clears throat> what is prevenient grace? Prevenient grace, in a nutshell, is the grace that goes before us. It is the grace that goes before us in salvation. Um, it is a grace that can lead us to salvation. Pardon me while I let Cat back in. And prevenient grace doesn't by itself save us, but it can lead us that way. It can lead us there, but it doesn't by itself save us. Um, Calvinists have um, something that they call common grace. And in both cases, it is grace that is given to everyone, but there the similarity ends. For, for Wesley and those who are in his um, theolog theological heritage, we understand prevenient grace mean the grace of God that is given to everyone that enables us to turn to Christ. It is the grace that is given to everyone that enables us to turn to Christ. Um, it is God seeking all of us out. Common grace is quite different. And for, for Calvin, those who, are, <clears throat> those who are saved or lost are predetermined. That God makes that choice. And for Calvin, common grace is the idea that God still loves in some way even those who he predestined to be lost and so the very fact that they exist the, the very fact that they can <clears throat> have healthy sunny days or 
carry out their business or trade, that is common grace. It never, it'll never save, but just the very fact that they exist and enjoy whatever they have is a gift from God. But that common grace is in no way saving. In no way does it lead to salvation. <clears throat> um, and so it is, <clears throat> pardon me, it is here that we get to the real, one of the real distinctives between Wesley and Calvin. In a lot of respects, their thought is very similar. At one point, Wesley said that he was a hair's breadth from being a Calvinist, um, but that's a pretty big hair when it comes to this notion of grace. <clears throat> so, prevenient grace is the idea that everyone is given the ability to turn towards Christ, the ability to turn to God. So this, this it directly is related to Wesley's understanding of original sin. Um, I said that a couple of weeks ago in talking about original sin, I said that Wesley described basic human nature in terms just as bleak as Calvin ever did. Um, he was right along with everyone else in the Western tradition, Luther and St. Augustine. And here's where it takes a little bit of nuance to get it. That is basic human nature. That is the natural fallen self. But for Wesley, there's no one actually in that state. There's no one actually in that state of a total natural fallen self because God has given his prevenient grace to every man, woman, and child on the planet. Does that mean that all of them will repent and come to faith? No. But it just enables them to do that. <clears throat> so prevenient grace does not save us, does not save you, but it gives you the it gives you the possibility. It gives you the possibility. Um, and we can envision prevenient grace in a number of different ways. <clears throat> and these are not mutually exclusive. We could envision prevenient grace as being um, a, a divine call that goes out to everyone. God calls everyone. And we see that in the New Testament. You know, Christ saying, I will draw all men to myself. Um, <clears throat> or in John chapter 1, in his prologue, the light of the world, light, the true light which enlightens everyone is coming into the world. Um, that, that tells us that there is a universality to God's grace. There is a universality to it that God desires that everyone will be saved. Um, <clears throat> so, Provenient grace we can look at in terms of that is God calling us. I've heard some people refer to that as like the, the hound of heaven seeking us out. We could also envision provenient grace as being um, some tiny spark of divinity that is in each one of us that enables us to turn to Christ. So for being in grace, it can be we can envision as God seeking us out. We can envision it to be um, the ability that God gives each of us to repent and come to faith. Um, we could also envision it um, in terms of how God might act in in any individual life. And so just to pick up for instance you um, you're in church and the preacher has just preached an incredible sermon and you 
<clears throat> and it, that sermon is speaking to you right here. And um, they go into communion and going up to receive communion. It hits you. Jesus died for me. Jesus died for me. Um, what is it that enabled that preacher's sermon to speak to you in here? It wasn't your ears. And it wasn't how eloquent the preacher was. But that was the work of God. That was provenient grace that put you there. That opened your heart to hear it. Um, or if you went to the altar at some point during a revival or at summer camp or whenever what is it that prompted you to go down front to an altar that's provenient grace provenient grace is the idea that no one comes to god on our own terms we don't do that um when we come to god it is because he is has reached out to us first. Um, <clears throat> that provenient grace is, it is resistible. We can simply ignore. And sadly, a lot of people do. We can ignore the voice of God calling us. We can ignore it. We can ignore the work of God around us. We can ignore it. Or we can listen. And we can repent and come to faith. We can repent and believe. But that is provenient grace in a nutshell. It is the idea that God reaches out to all of us. And is calling all of us. And that God empowers us to respond. So if you're listening to this and you know that you are in Christ, you know that you're right with God through Christ, you know that Jesus died for you, that he rose again from the dead on your behalf. If you know that, the very fact that you know that, however that began, is that occurred because of provenient grace you didn't res you didn't come to christ on your own you didn't come to christ because you had a good idea to do it because you wanted to you came to christ because god was calling you first and we have the ability to say no we have the the ability to walk away um <clears throat> again this draws another distinctive between grace for John Wesley and John Calvin. For in Calvin, grace is irresistible. God selects beforehand who's going to be saved and who's going to be lost. And those who are saved, that is done. It's done. Um, it's irresistible. For Wesley, on the other hand, Grace is resistible. We can say no. We have the prerogative to simply walk away. So that is provenient grace. And to me, as a good Wesley, and I've been a Methodist all my life, um, I love that doctrine. This idea that however I came to Christ, or you came to Christ, it's because he was reaching out to you first. I love that. That is um, that is a beautiful doctrine to me. If you are, you know, if you are hardcore um, predestinating Calvinist, you may not you may not agree with me, and that's okay. We'll find out on the other side of the river who's right. With that, I hope you have a great rest of your Wednesday.